Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 19th, and my guest is Adam D'Angelo, founder of the website Quora. And I'm recording this episode at Quora's headquarters in Mountain View, California, high above uh, Castro Street, but not that high. So we may hear the occasional honk or truck sound in the background. Uh, Adam, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. So what is Quora for listeners who haven't been there? So Quora is a knowledge sharing platform. Uh, and we basically want to connect people who have knowledge with other people who need it. And it takes the, the product takes the format of questions and answers. So anyone can come and ask a question. And then we try to show those questions to people who are going to be especially qualified to answer them. And then those people can write answers. And over time, we try to build up this database of high-quality answers to questions that can be useful to everyone. How did you get here? How's, how did your career path end up in the side? I think it's about six years old now. Yeah, so let's see. So I started out, I uh, studied computer science in college, but I was also interested in social science and, and economics. And uh, after college, I went to Facebook, um, which was... Uh, That's a website, I think, that also... Yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> I've heard of them. Yep. So I think, uh, I think Facebook was a very interesting application of both computer science, but also social science and some of this theory about signaling and, uh, and how users behave in these, in these large-scale social products. Because there's a weird online community. I, I, we talked beforehand about signaling, and I don't usually think of social media as being a signaling phenomenon. For me, it's mainly a place where I get information or try to spread information about, say, econ talk. Uh, but I probably did some signaling without realizing it. So wh- why do you mention that? Uh, I think a lot of what motivates people to participate in these social networks, uh, especially things like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, is uh, is a desire to signal things about themselves that information is going to be useful to to other people. Um, and so, there's a, it's an uh, it's it's one of the first chances that we've had to, to really apply signaling theory to product design. Um, and so I studied, when I was, uh, one, one summer in college, I went, I, I studied uh, at the, uh, there was a group at MIT called the Sociable Media Group doing some research on that that really opened my eyes to, to some of that. And then uh, Facebook was a great chance to, to apply it. And, uh, and then after leaving Facebook, I looked, I looked around uh, to sort of decide what, what I wanted to do. And um, I'd always been interested in knowledge sharing and questions and answers and um, this idea that there's been a there's a huge amount of knowledge that's out in people's heads that's not on the internet it's not very easy to get access to it's a huge amount of knowledge that's I think sort of locked in research papers where you need to know a certain amount of uh, very domain specific language and uh, to even navigate to to figure out where, what you want to get access to and so I thought that there was just an opportunity to really build a platform that would get all this knowledge out to, to the world and make something that could last for, for a really long time. So some people would say that's what the Internet is. It's just a knowledge-sharing thing. So right now, if I wanted to solve a problem I had or figure out something I didn't know the answer to, I would just enter it into Google. And there are other sites that Yahoo Answers that lets people answer stuff. How does Quora differ from those, and what's the, dif- what's the importance of that difference? So, uh, so I think I'd say compared to the internet in general, one of the problems on the internet, if uh, so, if, if you want to get knowledge that's already on the internet, I think there's there's a lot of good ways to do that. Google does a very good job of of uh, indexing all that information and making it available to to everyone. Um, the, the 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 challenge we're interested in is how do you get more information onto the internet in the first place? Um, and so there have been some other attempts to to do this, other question and answer products, but Jeeves generally, yes, Jeeves. yep, is that still around? Uh, it's still around. It's, it's, it's actually really more of a search engine than a question and yeah. answer platform. Um, so th- there's been all these other attempts to to make this work, but 
It's actually, it, it turns out to be pretty challenging to run one of these systems at scale and not have the quality um, just degrade to this kind of, uh, you know, mess where there's, there's nothing really good going on and there's no experts participating. Right, I might get 100 answers to my question and I'm going to have to read all of them to figure out anything. Yep. It should be a disaster. So how do you try to avoid that? Yeah, and so, so we're able to have things like, so we had Hillary Clinton answering some questions. We've had Obama answering questions. We were able to set up a, uh, uh, an environment where experts want to participate. And there's a, there's a lot of different pieces that go into the puzzle. Um, one of the first things we did, one of the ways we differentiated early on was that we required everyone to use their real names. Um, and real names are really important because they mean, a real name means that an expert or someone with sort of real world. Some reputation. Real world reputation. Even can, if they don't always tell the truth. So I'm, I'm not sure your politicians are your best example of, of experts, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, it lets us, uh, it lets someone with a real world reputation bring that reputation into the platform and start out with this credibility. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, as these, these other platforms at the time when we started didn't really use real names. And so that, uh, that just put them at a disadvantage. And, and it was, it's very discouraging to an expert to, start to, to have to start from zero uh, in an online system. So, so that, that was one piece of the puzzle. But since then, one of the most important things for us has been personalization. So we've uh, invested very heavily in getting the right answers to the right people and getting the questions to the people who are going to be able to write really good answers. Um, and so, and that, that's something that we've gotten better and better at over time, and we're still continuing to, to invest and, and get better at. And so, so ideally, you have this environment where people are seeing the content, the questions and the answers that are, that are the right questions and answers for them. Um, and that, that's usually to a totally different experience than what other users are having. So sometimes you go to the Internet or you might go to Quora with a particular question because you really want an answer, you got a pressing question or or something you're just really curious about. But sometimes you just go, because oh, I'm bored, I'm looking for some interesting content, this might be fun. Uh, do you have any perception of the mix of users in those two camps? Uh, it's mixed. It's about, I'd say, maybe half and half. It's, uh, there's, there's a lot of people who have important questions to them every day that are trying to get an answer to that. And then there's other people who just, uh, they're bored, maybe they read our digest emails, they, um, they get... Um, they get provoked by a particular question that they're curious about, and and then they'll go and, and read that. And I, I think I almost think of the the reading behavior as sort of like your your mind is rewarding you for getting some information that might be helpful to you later. And so sure. you get this, this sort of um, uh, this sort of short term payoff that it, it feels good to to learn new things and to to express your curiosity. But speaking of signaling, so before this interview, I thought you know maybe I should just not maybe I should. I went on the site, right, which I've been on before, but I thought to refresh my memory, make sure I'm explore some things, maybe I'll get some ideas for questions. And then I thought, gee, should I ask a question? And then I realized, hmm, do I really want people to know I'm asking that question, right? Because that's that's one thing. One of the questions I ended up asking, I didn't ask this question, I searched on it, was what should I ask Adam D'Angelo, which I thought was a really um, unclever, but not a bad idea, right? But Obviously, the personalization change, the non-anonymity changes people's willingness to participate in the site in certain ways, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we actually have a feature where you can ask an anonymous question if, you're, okay. uh, if that's important. So, but mo most people, mo the vast majority of users don't ask questions. Most people are, it, it turns out that almost all questions that people have are questions that someone else has had in the past. <laughs> And, Nothing um, new under the sun. Yeah, and it's actually part of our strategy is that we don't want to have 20 versions of each question. We want to have one version, and that allows us to concentrate all the answers' energy into that one place. And then that helps to generate the best possible answers because people know that there's this one place where they're going to answer the question. It's going to be kind of definitive for a long time. And so that's a big challenge. You know, For example, I really like photography and I'm beyond a photography website like uh, uh, DP Review, which is my favorite. And in the forum, someone will ask a question. It's been asked 273 times, but this poor person who's got in, you know, just joined the forum, was lazy, didn't search, 
Or they ask the question a slightly different way and they didn't find it. And everyone jumps on them and says, you know, sometimes they're kind and they'll put a link. This has been asked 40 times. Here's one of the better ones. But obviously one of the challenges is how do you figure out what questions like another question, mm -hmm. right? So how do you solve that? Um, and give me, if you, if you can, if you're comfortable, I'd like to know like, how many questions gets that get asked a day, roughly. I mean, what kind of volume are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. So, so we don't share numbers on the volume of questions. We uh, to answer your. But the answer is a lot. Yeah, it's it's, it's a lot. Even it's, though not everyone asks, most people don't ask. Doesn't matter. There's a lot of people who ask. A yeah, lot of it, it's a lot, and it's growing very quickly at, at the rate that uh, the rest of the the product is is growing. So, so if you want a sense of scale, we have about a hundred million monthly unique visitors. That was the last number we announced. That's a big um, number. So yeah, it's it's a lot of people, but most of them are looking at questions that someone else asked. Um, in terms of, back to your question about how, how, yeah, how, do you we, merge? how we know how do you decide to merge a question. Get. So there's a few things. One is we have, uh, we have a machine learning algorithm that can look at two questions and determine whether those, make a guess at whether those are likely the same question or not. And so if you're going to ask a question that we think is a duplicate, then we'll go and show you that question and say, hey, you probably wanted to just look at this question. Um, some questions get through that filter, though, and so we have a, a, another set of systems that try to, to merge questions later on. Um, there's a sort of offline machine learning process that takes a little bit longer. Then there's uh, users uh, of the product can actually go in and, and merge two questions. Mm -hmm. and we have a, a process for how those get reviewed, and, and uh, we make sure that we control the quality on cool. that. So it's not perfect. But it ends up being a much better experience than on, say, like the photography feed forum where there were 20 versions of the same thing. So if I, if I could go back and visit the Adam D'Angelo of 2010 when you had this some kind of vision, uh, how's it turned out? Something like you imagined, nothing like it, or pretty much just bigger? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely bigger uh, than, than I expected. I think, you know, I, I think everyone in the Internet industry has been surprised over the last few years at just how big all these markets have gotten. Um, one, you know, you have all these people coming onto the Internet for the first time. That have, all these people have phones, so they're using the products more. Um, but there's also an, another thing I think is a, a huge factor here is that personalization is a really powerful technology as far as its effect on markets. So in the offline world, let's say for magazines, um, everyone reading a magazine has to see the same magazine and the same order of the articles. A little bit. They might put a different cover on the West Coast versus the East Coast. Yeah, that right. was like so a big might, breakthrough. Right. There might be, there might be five variants or, or something like that. There might be 10, 20. Right. Um, but still, they're, they're the same stories in the magazine, and, and you have this limited amount of physical space to, to hold them in. Um, but with the internet, you can have sort of an infinite amount of content, and you can have every, uh, every user getting a totally different experience. And so that's meant that markets that used to be fragmented, like, say, the magazine industry, now you can, uh, on, on the internet, you can just have a, a very small number of products that are able to reach a much bigger audience because they can they can show the the content to the right people. Um, so I think I think you know you can see this with see this with Google. There's just one search engine. Everyone uses the one search engine. There's Netflix. Netflix instead of um, instead of all these different TV channels and different shows on the channels and different cable providers, you just basically have Netflix. Um, and, and I think personalization is this, it, it basically has this effect on markets where it makes the market a lot bigger because a single company can address this it's very diverse. Right, there's one, but needs. they're providing a million channels instead of, you know, issues of monopoly that they may not have the incentive to customize it, but that's not really the case because they're constantly trying to customize it to maximize their reach and then their revenue, right? Yeah, and they can, um, so they may not have sort of head-to-head -head competition every day the way you might have had in some previous industries, but instead they have this very strong incentive to just get people to use the, get the existing users to use the product more, um, which, you know, and, and effectively Netflix is in competition with Facebook, even though they're, you, you think of them as totally different markets. People have this discretionary time that they're going to spend on Correct. one or the other, and, and the better Netflix gets, 
the more time is going to go to Netflix, and the better Facebook gets, the more time is going to go to Facebook. And the same is true for Quora. Obviously, Hulu is a competitor, even though it's not an answer question and answer site, right? Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's in the same category of interesting things I can do on my computer or phone. Yep, yeah, absolutely. When I have some spare time. Yep. Um, you don't appear to have any ads on the site, uh, and yet, according to my research outside of Quora, you're worth something probably over a billion. You're, your valuation of the company is over a billion dollars. Um, do you have plans for monetization that you can talk about? Uh, so, so we actually do have ads. Um, we are running ads on a small percentage of our, our pages, and uh, it's just a small test right now. But so far, the the results have been very promising, and uh, and we're looking at we're going to scale that up over the the, the years ahead. Our, our Valuation, um, you know, I, I'm not going to take a particular stance on what our valuation is, but uh, the valuation that investors give us is based on projections of, of the future and, and based on the amount of usage that a product has. You can assume that we're going to monetize in a similar way to, to other similar products right. per unit of usage. But do people worry that that there's a big difference between uh, an ad-free site and a site that's full of ads and how that might affect the culture and the ease and the pleasure that people get from visiting the site. Is there a trade-off there? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been very uh, upfront with our users that we will run ads in the future. Um, we have uh, we don't intend to have an, a product that's full of ads. We, we think we can make a lot of money enough to sustain the business without having to, to sort of make the user experience a lot worse. I think a good example of this is Google. Um, you know, you do a search, most of the time you don't see any ads. If you happen to search for something that's commercial, then you'll see more ads. All um, the time. And I want to say, who do I call to tell them I already bought that? They can stop. Yeah. It's interesting. that They'll get better at that, I assume. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So the company's six years old. You've had a lot of growth, obviously, by definition, because you didn't have any users when you started. Now you get $100 million. But um, as an outsider, there's a temptation to assume that you're bored. You had this great idea. It came to fruition, like enough, we're done, the site's up and running, it's growing steadily. Is the thrill gone, or is it still fun to come to work every morning? Yeah, well, it's it's, it's still really fun, and I think um, one of the things that's really exciting to me is just the scale that we're getting to, and so we're, we're starting to reach like a big percentage of the U.S. and the rest of the world every month, and um, that's, um, you know, that, that's inspiring sort of on its own, but it also creates a lot of challenges internally, so just to the growth basically follows this exponential growth pattern. And so uh, so there's a lot more people using the product every week than the week before. And that creates a lot of challenges internally. So we have to make sure that our our infrastructure and our, our technical systems are able to, to be ready for the load. We have to make sure that our personalization technology can do better and better as we get bigger and bigger. Um, the bigger we get, we also, we also get more data, and so that lets us do a better job in in machine learning, in personalizing. It lets us run more experiments. Um, that's something else that I think is a pretty uh, interesting part of, of what we do. That has, we'll, has, we'll talk about that, but I, I have to warn you now, because you're going to see this big spike when this Econ Talk episode gets released. So you're going you're to want to prepare for that and probably put, you know, buy, some, buy an extra server. Yeah, well, it's not, we're on Amazon Web Services, so, so luckily we can, just, we can just turn on some more servers and just rent them by the hour. So, oh, phew. Okay, so, so you've got to warn me when it, when it is about to be posted. <laughs> you have to borrow some money. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the product itself, um, you know, the, as a user, I see questions I see the answers. Do you do other things besides questions and answers? Is there product different, uh, variation or innovation besides just the Q&A part of the site? Uh, we've, we've experimented with some formats outside of questions and answers, but over and over we've just seen that the question and answer product is doing really well and getting bigger and bigger. And it takes, it's almost taken our full energy as a company to just keep up with the question and answer product and make sure that the quality stays really high. Um, and just bring it to, you know, we brought it to mobile phones. We've, um, as new technologies come out, we have to keep pace with that, and we have to keep our costs under control. So we have, there's a lot to do just for questions and answers, so that's kept us focused. But I imagine that in the long term, we will branch out into other formats of knowledge besides questions and answers. So besides asking questions or reading questions and answers that other people have asked, 
uh, and answered, uh, you can sign up for topics on the site and see Q&A related to a particular topic. Does Do you, Adam, D'Angelo, do you have topics that you subscribe to yourself personally? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, uh, I, I, I follow a lot of topics. I Some of the ones I'm particularly interested in are in, related to machine learning. Um, so that's just a, a personal interest of mine, but also it's it's super applicable to, to what we're doing every day. So, you know, it reminds me, I mean, I've told the story before, but one of my favorite management stories, Sam Walton supposedly used to fly in a private plane. He uh, was the founder of, of uh, Walmart. And he'd see a Walmart truck on the road, land in a cornfield, or I don't know if it was literally a cornfield, but land somewhere ahead of the truck and then hitchhike stick his thumb out and get a ride with the trucker into town and chat with the trucker and then go into the actual store and see what, you know, it's called managed by walking around, among other things. But, uh, you know, I always like this image of this trucker you know, driving along, trying to stay awake and seeing the founder and CEO of his company there on the side of the road with his thumb out and trying not to uh, have a heart attack. Uh, but that's the standard way in brick and mortar businesses that that CEOs are renowned for getting information. They get their hands dirty. They get in the trenches. Then you have the contrast with the CEOs, you know, up in the executive suite, never really tries the product and just relies on, say, the marketing team, et cetera. So you, you've got a ton of information about how the site's doing, but you also have the one data point of you as user. <laughs> does that affect you at all? Do you just, does that ever bleed into the decisions you make? Do you ever like slam your fist down on the desk and say, why am I getting these bad answers or bad questions or whatever? Or is it all just driven by the data? Um, you know, I'd say most of it goes on data, but I, I definitely use my own experience. And, and one, one thing I try to do uh, that you might find interesting is I, I actually try to behave more like what I think a normal user sure. behaves so that yeah. I don't, so that my own experience is not too distorted from that. Yeah. Um, so you could say that as the CEO, maybe I would just artificially kind of like force myself to write tons of answers and, and follow tons of topics and give the system lots of information about me so that it could do a really good job. Yeah. But, then, but then I would have this experience that was nothing like a normal user. So, Correct. So I actually go out of my way with using Quora and, and other internet, internet products. I just try to like act like a normal user so that the information I get isn't, isn't so biased. Um, but yeah, you know, in terms of it affecting my my behavior. It, it's it's good for generating theories and ideas. Usually, I'd like to test those theories and ideas on some uh, on you know ideally on a controlled experiment. But also, you know, we look at we look at surveys of our users. We look at uh, re- things users are reporting. We look at we, look, we have all kinds of sources of information. And so I try to I try to make sure that the the ideas I generate from my own usage are consistent with the data. Because if, if you don't do that, you can really just go off in a, a direction that's crazy. Destroy your site, effectively, yeah. yeah. That, would be, that would be bad. Yeah. Um, let's talk about personalization because, you know, I'm fascinated by how this happens in, in the web and the different sites that I go to. So, you know, in the case of a site like Twitter... I follow, I personalize it because I choose who to follow. Um, that's a site I happen to know somewhat. Um, if I'm on your site and I enter a topic, machine learning, economics, meditation, Boston Red Sox, am I going to get the same stream as other users who've entered those topics? Uh, so, so the way it works is we have, uh, we have a lot of different sources of input. We have the topics that you've followed. We have the people who you are following. We have uh, all your behavior from what you've read in the past, questions that you've answered in the past, questions you've followed. And we have an algorithm that takes all that information as input and then uses that to try to predict what's going to be interesting to you and what questions you're going to want to answer. And uh, and so it ends up in practice being very different for different people, even if they're following the same topic. Um, you know, it will depend on where you live, and it will. Depend. So it's that personalized. Yeah, it's it's actually uh, it's 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 very very personalized, and and different users have very different experiences on on our product. But as you mentioned when we talked before the interview started, a lot of the personalizations on the answer side. So talk about that. 
on in terms of showing what core answers. Yeah. So um, so a lot of a lot of what we do, a, a lot of core usage is we, we actually when, when we started the the service, our first version of it, we expected that people would come to Quora when they had a question, and then they would come to Quora when they wanted to write an answer, and those would be the two big use cases. But we designed the product so that people could read other people's answers. And that very quickly became, we, we noticed that that was just something people love to do. Sure. And so that has emerged as one of the big use cases for, for the product. Um, so, so we use a lot of different signals to, to figure out how to personalize what, what answers you see. Because we have millions of answers, and a, any given user is going to see a very small subset of, you know, maybe thousands of answers out of the millions. But you're also going to determine which people get sent questions so I've been asked questions. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I play one on on the internet. Obviously, um, you know, I might get a question I, about, say, Keynesianism or Hayek or whatever. So, what determines whether I get those questions as a so-called expert? So there, there's there's all kinds of factors. There's uh, what answers you've written in the past. There's what you know it, the answers that you wrote in the past were they on the same topic that the the new question is on. If, if so, that's probably a positive signal. You know, if you if you previously wrote a, an answer about economics, then the next time there's an economics question, that's probably going to be something you're more likely to want to answer and be good at answering than than a question on some other topic. Um, so that's that's one factor. We you know there's other things like if we if we feel like a question already got a great answer from someone else, then we might not show it to you because we want to spend your energy on filling out, you know, our, our, ultimately our, our mission is share and grow the world's knowledge. And so generating a lot of duplicate answers is not good for, for that. And so we want to sort of send the, send the questions to the people who are going to answer them best. So viewers rate the answers also, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's sort of two levels of rating. There's the viewers rating, but you also have inside information about how long people stayed on an answer and, and that kind of thing. Do mm-hmm. they both matter in terms of Determining who gets to see what when. Yeah, yeah, they're all they're all useful. Um, the the votes are a very important signal, especially not just like the number of votes, but who was the voter. So, mm. so did you get a vote from someone who we know really has authority on a particular topic? Um, that's an important signal to us. So, one of my favorite books is The Professor and the Madman by Simon Winchester, uh, and you learn which is about the. Among other things, about a lot of things, but one of the things it's nominally about is the creation of the Oxford English Dictionary. And you learn early on that there's a handful of people, in particular, a particular person who becomes a focal point of the book, who who discovers uh, a large number of the first usages of words in the English language. Because one of the things that the OED did is one of the first crowdsourcing um, um, information projects, basically, the editor went out and said, hey, if you know where these words come from, if you saw an earlier version than this, we'd love to have it. Some people would send in postcards with the book and where they they saw it. You know, they couldn't copy the page, Xerox the page, but they'd send a a page number. Do you have answerers who are like crazy common, who are answering an enormous number of questions that everybody loves and that, that you you literally know as opposed to the data knowing, as opposed to the machine and the algorithm knowing. Do you have individuals that you know are just like superbly good at this? Yeah, yeah. And how I many mean, are there? Are I there like 10 or are there right. like 1,000? Um, there's, I mean, thousands. But as far as like, like one person who comes to mind is uh, there's a professor at Berkeley, Richard Mueller, who has written a large number of answers about physics and about all, lots of other topics. Um, but he was one of the, the top answerers at, uh, at one point. Um, Did you do anything to keep him happy? Um, or is it just his, the thrill? You know, we, hopefully we build a good product, and that's what's going to keep him happy. Um, we have an event once a year where, where the top, uh, top writers can come to, to meet us at the headquarters here. That's cool. Um, How yeah, many people yeah. come? Uh, More than one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, probably a few hundred, I guess. Really? Oh, that's yeah. fun. And what do they do? Uh, they talk to each other. It's you know they, they they get to talk to me, ask questions. They get to um, yeah. You know, it, it's it's mostly I think just fun for them. But sure, it's, that's really cool. Yeah, th- this though is not really the motivation for them. No, to, I understand. It's just a fun. It yeah. just a, it makes them. And you know, one of the challenges you know that I have with this program is is creating a community because I've got a community, right? I've got 
tens of thousands of listeners who feel a connection to me every Monday morning, but I don't have as, and I have some of a connection to them, but we never see each other unless I do a live event, which I do every once in a while. And I, I struggle with ways to have online experiences or face-to-face that would give people, that would make it more fun just to be part of this experience. And that what you're doing is a great idea, right? That's one way to do it. I could at least have my guests come to a party. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I get 50, there's roughly 50 guests a year. Uh, I don't know how many would be interested in meeting and hanging out with the other guests, but that's an interesting thing. But the listeners, yep. creating a forum for the listeners, either in in real space or in virtual space, seems like a good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would probably start with virtual space if, yeah. if I were you. Yeah, I figured out how to do that very it, well. But it scales maybe, a lot better. Yeah, maybe we can talk about that later. Um, any big mistakes you want to share? Uh, regrets, things you just did, you can't believe you did now when you look back on it? Or um, just surprises, things you just can't believe that didn't work out and you had to totally change something? Yeah, I think, you know, I think in the early days of the company, we, and this was actually before we started doing a lot of controlled experiments. We, we added a lot of features to the product, and it got really complicated. And the Common co- problem the, the startups, co- yeah, new products. The complexity tax just has hurt us over and over, and um, it just slowed us down a lot. And you have, once you, you, know, you add the feature, and it, it'll increase usage in the near term, but it just means that you need to now, every other feature you're going to add has to be able to interact with that feature, and you're going to have to control for the effect of that feature in some future experiment, and you're going to have to be able to measure the impact of that feature, and you have to know when that feature breaks and fix bugs in it, and you have to explain to users how to use it. And uh, and then you get to this point where you have so many features and people inside the company don't even know all of them. Sure. And it's it's a huge, huge burden. So so that, that's probably, I think, like the main main thing. When I look back on, on our product development progress over the last few years, or even you know, the last six years, let's say, uh, I think that's that's definitely something that we that we we paid a very heavy heavy price for. So the site is more streamlined than it once was, or yeah, I mean, and we're also, I mean, it's one thing that's interesting about complexity is it's it's much it's much easier to prevent the addition of another feature that's going to make things more complex than it is to remove an existing feature because we, I mean, one thing that's very important to us is to we, we never want to. Uh, remove anyone's knowledge that they've shared, for example. That, that would be right. an absolute no for us. That's very important to our integrity that we maintain everything that everyone's shared forever. Um, and so that means that it's hard to, to get rid of, uh, of any kind of feature where, where, where people have, have contributed some information. So you mentioned controlled experiments. Um, tell me what proportion of your time here is doing those kind of experiments how much effort is it is it is it one a day one a week one a month and how do you do them and what's the nature of them because mm-hmm. you usually don't think of people often don't think of um, I mean, what do we mean controlled experiments so trying to figure out if the answers are right but that's not what we're talking about so yep so we have uh so one thing we have is a what we call an experiment framework and this is basically a set of Software that makes it very easy for us to run controlled experiments, and we, we made this big investment, uh, and maybe four years ago, to to create this experiment framework. I think usually companies don't do this until they get much bigger than than we do, but we're we're very serious about the the science of this here, and so we um, so we we built this experiment framework, and I think since then, I mean we we ran some experiments before the framework, but if you're just counting experiments that have happened since the framework, I think we've run about two thousand experiments and well, at any lot. given time we have about 30 experiments running concurrently um, and we let's see so we have the whole company is about 130 people um, there are 13 data scientists and so their job is to analyze data run the experiments analyze the experiments sort of like hold up, uphold our our integrity in terms of scientific process, um, and uh, and they're, so they're generally looking at data, analyzing data, determining what's true, um, and then there's a whole other set of employees, which is most of the company, that's creating the changes that go into the experiments to to then um, 
to, to be tested. So that's shocking, right? 10% of your staff is da- or data scientists, which is not normally what, an, at least this outsider would, would have thought, you know, in my mind, hey, you got to make the website work, you got to have some web designers, you got to make it look nice, you got to make it work correctly. You've got some algorithms running in the background, but uh, the idea that you're constantly trying to improve the site is surprising. Like, isn't it good enough? I mean, what's, what's wrong with it? <laughs> yeah. It works. I mean, I get information. And how much better could it be? Yeah, so um, let's see. So, so I, I think maybe one, one intuition that can help you understand this is that the, there's sort of a finite surface area that users can consume. So, so we build the product, and the, the surface area of the product can't really expand that much. Um, but and, and so at some point, you don't want to just keep adding surface area. You want to make the, the existing surface area better. And it's actually very hard to do that without running experiments. You know, people think that they have an idea for something that's going to be an improvement. Can you give me an example? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by surface area. Do you mean the physical size of what I can access with my eyes on the page? Yeah, well, let's say, like, if you were going to write down a, in words, if you were going to write down a description of everything that can happen on the product, all the features and how you use them and where they are and how you get to, to each particular thing you might want to do, that the length of that list. document, you could think of that as like the surface area okay. of the, the product. Um, so, so you want to, so 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 we want to make the the existing product better as opposed to just keep adding surface area. Um, you know, which is maybe not true at the very beginning. You know, at the beginning of a product, it's it's a totally different experience developing right. a product, a new product, because you have no data, you have no users, you are going entirely on intuition. Seat of the pants. Yep. So. Um, so, so anyway, so as we get, as we get more and more users, we can then start to use data and we can start to run experiments. And so, so we have lots of people coming up with changes, a big area of, of, a big category of work is in personalization. So getting better at showing you the, the answers that you're going to think are really good and really interesting. Um, and then getting better at showing you questions that you're going to want to answer. So you, you mentioned you survey users, but in general, you're not answering that question by asking me. You're going to look at my behavior on the site, which is going to be measured by what? Uh, so, it, for example, do you write more answers? Do you write better answers? And we, we have a way of assessing whether we think answers are better or, or worse. But uh, we look at those two things as, as we run a, an experiment. And that, that's usually a better, a more reliable indicator of whether we made the product better than a survey, but sure. surveys are also useful yeah, because course. surveys will pick up on things that the metrics can't Qualitative, tell you. yeah, things, yeah, I was annoyed. But usually if I'm annoyed, I won't come back. Or you, you'll see that, right? Yeah, but, yeah. but also, but, you know, maybe, maybe you'll come back more in the short term because you, you need, you, maybe, let's say your objective was to, to recruit people for your company and you decide that you're going to use Quora to do that. If we make it very hard for you to find questions to answer, you might actually spend more time looking for answers. You might have to you might have to write more answers to achieve the same goal. Yeah. So, so it's important to have some qualitative feedback to, to balance the quantitative. Sure. So it's, the qualitative feedback is also important to understand why something's happening. So you might you know, test a change, and suddenly people are just not using the product as much as, much as they used to, and we don't know why. And it could be something like. Oh well, if you were on a mobile phone with a bad connection, then kind of it, it just didn't work at all. Right, and nothing to do with the content, nothing to do with yeah. Right, for example. So, uh, and then there could be you know maybe there's just something where there's some in some other country there's a filter that the government has installed and we're triggering that with some change that we made and we we never would have detected that. Um, there's things you could never and never anticipate. So when you have an experiment. You're going to try something. You're going to add a feature, change the color of the logo, whatever it is. Um, do you usually have a hypothesis about what's going to happen or not? Or you're yeah. just kind of, you do. We, we've actually, so we, we didn't used to have this, but we actually decided to enforce the discipline that every experiment uh, ahead of time, it either has to, you have to either declare a hypothesis hmm. or you have to declare that there's explicitly no hypothesis and you're just doing it to learn and see what happens. And if you, if you have a hypothesis and the hypothesis turns out to be true, then we'll generally launch the feature. 
if you have uh, what we call a learning experiment and you, you pick up on some, some, some consequence of that experiment um, and you think that that would be a good thing to launch, we require you to run another experiment where that's the hypothesis. So, because otherwise you run into, you know, statistical significance sure. problems. So, how often do you run an experiment that fails in the sense of you thought this would turn out this way and it didn't? Uh, it's, it's most of the time. Uh, it's, I'd say it's maybe a, a third of... Not. I don't know, but, well. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I hear numbers from other companies that are, that are actually even more negative. Um, so... I, I, it's hard to say. Is that depressing? I mean, it's definitely depressing. It's if, fascinating, actually, yeah, I mean, more if, than anything else. I, I can tell you, if you're, if you're coming in to, to work in Quora and it's the first Internet company you've worked in with experiments, it's depressing. Because <laughs> people in... They're all other, excited. They're yeah, gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. it's, just, it's just counterintuitive. You know, everything that you've done in your life beforehand usually has worked. And... There's or at least you thought it did. Yeah, now you, you're going to find. Now you're going to test it. Exactly right, and I think a lot of other companies are just operating on this mindset where they're just in like dreamland, where they they think that all these things they're doing are working, but the real reason that the product is working is some kind of network effect or, or times past. It's like I have more listeners than I had five years ago. Doesn't mean I'm a better interviewer or better. What it could just be more people have access to podcasts, right? Right, right. So there's all kinds of factors that kind of distort people's assumptions about how well they're doing. And, the, and there's also just biases, like wishful thinking. People, Main one, people yeah. wanna People <laughs> want to think that they're, they're good, and, and it's hard to get this, this evidence that like, actually most of the time it didn't work, uh, especially after you've... And, and, and just to, to make a point about how, how extreme this can get, in, especially in some organizations, maybe you worked on this effort for six months before running this experiment and then you need to find out that all the last six months of, of what you did didn't do anything. Yeah, it's no fun. And, and you know, maybe it's, it. it's, 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 it feels bad, but in, in some organizations there can be consequences. Like, that could mean that you're going to get fired, yeah, yeah, right? Or it could sure. mean that, that you're going to lose a lot of responsibility. Um, and so, so there's all these forces that kind of push people toward this irrational or uh, not objective interpretation of, of, of results. So a lot of them fail, but some of them don't. Um, what, how important is that? You know, my first thought would be, well, come on, after six years, you kind of know most of the things you're going to know. Now, it's true your listener base is, your viewer base is bigger. It's different. It's more diverse, and maybe maybe it's just bigger. Um, how much more is there to learn? Oh, there's, there's tons more. Um, there's... You know, there, there's the user base gets bigger, but we also get more information about even the existing users. Um, there's technology is advancing all the time. Yeah. There's you know new platforms coming along that we want to support. There's you know one of the biggest forces is that machine learning techniques are just getting better and better, and uh, and so we want to try out some of these new techniques. We want to see whether they really you know someone will publish a research paper and looks great in the research paper, but when you try to get it into actual production code where you have to engineer it, it turns out that there's some things that make it not actually work as well as a much simpler technique that was implemented, that was a- able to be implemented better. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of, of things. And, and then the, the other thing that helps drive things forward and make it faster and faster is so we, as we hire more people, so we're 130 people now, we're able to take on sort of more challenging projects that we wouldn't have done when we were, say, 20 people. Um, and so we have, we have a, a, big, a, big, uh, a big fraction of the engineering team. All they work on is tools and infrastructure to make the rest of the engineering team more efficient. And so, so uh, challenges that would have been too hard to take on before get to be possible and, and feasible because of the, the progress that we call this the platform team. The progress that they make un, unblocks uh, efforts that then other teams can, can take on. And so, so you have this real like, multiplicative effect within the, within the product development team where you can now take on things that you just couldn't have considered uh, earlier on. So that, that kind of, that really, that we, we don't see a lot of like, diminishing returns because of those, those factors. So what are some results that you found from experiments that, that did work that surprised you about how important they are? Uh, 
You know, one thing is just the importance of speed, so making the product fast for users. You know, it, it makes sense that a faster sure. product, people will use it more, but just exactly how important that is, how much, you know, down to milliseconds um, it will cause an increase in usage. And when you average these things out over millions of users, you can, you can really pick up on these very, very small differences. I mean, that's a shocking thing, right? It shouldn't be to an economist, but because we'd say, well, I'm going to lower the price a penny. And people are going to want to buy more. But, well, yeah, something more. Not everybody's going to respond to it. Surely a millisecond couldn't make a difference in whether people stay on the site or not. But it does. Yeah, milliseconds, I'd say. But I think that, um, you know, one way to think about it is, so, so transaction costs are a huge issue for us. Just any, any friction anywhere is, is going to greatly decrease the amount of usage something has. And... Um, I think I should cut out my introduction to EconTalk. Is that a transaction cost? Maybe we should just get, get to it. Maybe, of course, some people solve this, in a, which shocks me again because of my age, but a lot of people I know listen to EconTalk at double speed, one and a half, um, which is maybe that's the right people when they meet me say, you sound different. It's because, yeah, you're listening to me at chipmunk speed. I'm already kind of a chipmunk, so it's kind of bad. Yeah, but, I, I, but it's hard to realize how powerful, even as an economist, uh, we know that, Annoying things on the internet. You just you stop. You just go elsewhere. You just you know. That's why I'm. I appreciate my listeners telling me how much they care about audio quality because I've tried very hard to make the audio quality better, um, and uh, I think it makes a huge difference, right? Even though it's a subtle kind of transaction cost. Yeah, I think you know my, my my intuition off the top of my head is if you cut the introduction down to something very short. I think mentioning econ talk is important for branding and reminding yeah. people to go sure. back later. But I think you could do it in a much short amount of time. You know, that, you can think of the sort of like what's the payoff that people get for listening per unit time. Yeah, It's sure. going to go up if you decrease the amount of time to, to get the same payoff. Yeah, yeah. It's a small amount, and people do just kind of fast yeah. forward through it. A lot of them, a lot of them they'll find it comforting to hear the theme music. Others, you know, maybe that's a barrier. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, I think you might get uh, somewhere between... One percent and point one percent more yeah. more usage well, if you if you cut it down. That's to, all good. To I don't, I don't get much gain from it being longer, yeah. except having to, <laughs> not having to re-record it. Tell me about your typical day, if, if there is such a thing. So, right now, your typical day, this particular particular day, has an hour plus time taken out for an econ talk interview, and we we hung out a little bit beforehand, and you gave me a tour of the place, and so that was very very nice of you. But uh, this is not a typical day, although I'm sure you do some media. Um, what percentage of your day is spent arguing with the data scientists about how to interpret an experiment versus getting funding for the next place you're going to head to versus trying to market the site versus managing 130 people, which must be very different than it was five years ago when it was whatever the smaller number was? Mm -hmm. So I'd say... And how do you teach yourself you didn't study any of that, so you're just kind of learning by the seat of your pants. You get, you'd like to ask a question, but it's not an easy one to answer. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've, I think I've just read a lot of books about management. That was, that was where that came from. Um, I'd say most, I, I'm relatively internally focused for, as far as CEOs go. We've raised a lot of money in the past. We still have a lot of money in the bank, so we don't have to worry about fundraising very often. Um, we, um, I don't do a lot of press because I think the product kind of tends to market itself. There's sure. all, as we get more content, more users find out about it, and that's a, that's a more efficient channel than, than, uh, than media generally. Um, so I spend most of my time internally focused. So that's things like, like let's say that this morning I, um, I had a meeting with our head of product, um, and uh, he, he's actually an economist, as is his background. Um, so he, uh, so we were working on setting what the goals for the product team are going to be over the next quarter, um, and then we're trying to um, resolve a sort of an issue where let's say some people in the company have uh, one opinion about a certain topic, and other people have a different opinion. So we're trying to figure out how do we how do we get to a constructive resolution of this this difference. Um, and so there's a lot, you know, that, that's, you could call that management, but it's also about, it's a lot of that is about product direction and, um, and it's, it's very deeply tied to what we're doing as, as a company. Um, I spend time on recruiting. I spend time on just looking at data myself, 
trying to stay informed, trying to build good intuitions. You know, I look at all the experiment results. One, one thing that's, that we set up that's been really great is we have this, um, this internal mailing list where anytime there's uh, a data request or an experiment that gets analyzed, the, the person who analyzes it will write up the analysis and send it to this mailing list for the whole rest of the company to see. And so that provides a sort of like archive for us to all learn from from everyone else's research. And that could, that'll give other people ideas. But it's also good for me to just stay in touch with like, hey, what's working? Is our, like, do we, do we need to adjust? Should we have more people working on this aspect or more people working on something else? I can learn a lot from, from the results of, of experiments. How do you keep your team of data scientists tooled up? So obviously you're trying to read a lot. You're asking you're following machine learning on Quora, but you're reading books, you're reading journal articles, et cetera, and you're sharing them, I'm sure, with your staff when you find them interesting. But how do you keep them, is there any formal way that you keep them educating themselves? Besides encouraging them to listen to EconTalk, of course. <laughs> um, they, they, they are fans of EconTalk generally here. It's a um, Good. Glad to hear. So we, let's see, the data scientists... Um, I ask that because machine learning is a relatively this, is a, this field must be exploding in terms of its technical progress, experimentation within the field. Uh, like you said, there'll be a paper that comes out. People think it works, maybe it doesn't. It's a very young and I would think embryonic area with lots of things to figure out and potential for growth. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we don't have anything that's really formalized around this. We have a culture that really values learning and, and like observing the, the world and what other companies are doing. Uh, and so, for example, we have like, there's a group that meets to, to look at the latest deep learning research. Um, and there's, there's uh, there've been other reading groups in the past. We'll have external speakers come in we have, um, you know, just a lot of mailing lists where people are circulating things that they've found that are that are relevant. But often, a lot of the learning comes internally from from running experiments and seeing what happens. And I think we, we tend not to trust the results of other companies' uh, product changes very much. May not apply to you. Yeah. They, yeah, they might not apply to might us. Be mistakes. The, the company, <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of the time the companies are making mistakes. Um, the companies have different user bases than us. They have a different strategy, a different position in the market. Um, they, uh, you know, they, they just they have things that are done in different ways that might be the right thing for that company, but it wouldn't be the right thing for, for our company. You used a, a phrase about 20 minutes ago or so about, uh, it was close to a motto about knowledge, the way you see Quora. Do you remember that phrase? Uh, you... So the, the mission is share and grow the world's knowledge. Yeah, that, okay. That's yeah, that's it. Yeah. So how often do you remember that? Uh, because one thing I find interesting about business and life is if I said to you, what's your motto? You just told me. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times we don't always act according to our motto. We think we do, right? Mm-hmm. But we end up being pushed and pulled by all kinds of other incentives. We talked about that recently on the program uh, with uh, Ryan Holiday. We're talking about nonprofits. But even in a profit-focused business, you forget. Um, how do you keep that front? Do you think you do a good job keeping it front and center? And we're, how much time do you spend thinking about just what you're actually doing as opposed to the day-to-day minutia of uh, executing the business? Um, so I, I think the mission we remember all the time. I, I'd say we're a relatively mission-driven company compared to, to other companies. And so one of the things we do when we're interviewing candidates, for example, is we, we look for whether they're um, we think that they would be interested in our mission. Is that their motivation to come work here, or how much does that compare to? Or do they just see us as one of ten different companies that that they could work for, and they're sort of all interchangeable? Um, so I think I think getting employees in here in the first place who care about knowledge is uh, is sort of more important than just like reciting the phrase over and over. But but the phrase is important because that's how people remember to look for it in, in other employees that they're that they're hiring. Um, but yeah, it definitely like repetition is is very important. But Mike, I guess I didn't ask the question very well. What I'm also really thinking of is it's a wonderful thing to create a site that people enjoy using. Just that's just great, right? It's a wonderful thing. There's of course a lot of substitutes for ways to spend my time, as we were talking about earlier. 
there's a big difference between that and changing people's lives, um, giving them an answer to a question that's, again, life-saving, life-changing, transformative versus, oh, phew, I now, I, now, now I know that, or, oh, that was interesting, right? Knowledge is a really rich, complicated thing. It can be exhilarating, but it also can be practical. Does that get into your, into your guts day to day in the company? Do you, do you feel a sense of satisfaction? As you, I mean, it's great that you have all these users and all these people, you know, on the site. But do you have a feel for what's happening in their lives? Yeah, I mean, we actually we have a um, we have a internal process where people who employees who notice these kinds of things happening in the user base will share them with with other employees. Can you and, give us an example? Um, you know, so, some there was someone who uh, wasn't able to um, let's see, there was someone who wasn't able to to conceive. Um, in, uh, in in their marriage, and and they were able to through through some answers that they read, they were able to to figure out. That's a good do. one. So um, yeah, there's been you know there was there are questions about what it's like to be um, to have depression and how to how to overcome depression, and then there's these stories about other people who read these and someone who was going through some pretty bad times in their life through reading these answers, um, you know, was able to, to do a lot better and uh, just wrote me a personal email about it. So, yeah, we, we have that. Um, we, we, we like to, I think the employees especially, like, they, it's, it's, it's great to feel like a, a higher sense of purpose sure. than, than just, like, getting your work done. But you, do, you don't spread that in an active way. It's just sort of a, something that happens time to, from time to time. Yeah, we there was one period where we formalized it a little bit, um, but I think it's actually almost better to, to just let it go organically. So we had, um, I had Adam Smith, Abby Smith, Adam Smith, Abby Smith Rumsey on the program uh, recently talking about cultural memory and how challenging it is to archive the digital world and to deal with the collective memories that we have. And your site is a powerful place where there's some, I'd say there's a lot of information about how people perceive the world. Um, some certainly will look back on it in 100 years and maybe say it was perceived incorrectly. And we can see that because look how people answered these questions on Quora. But you've got this massive amount of information on the site. Do you ever think about how people in the future, whether it's at the Library of Congress or somewhere else, might be able to access this information, but let's put aside privacy for the moment, which is a whole other complicated piece of this, especially because you're using real people's names. But can you imagine ways that we might use the incredible knowledge in a meta way that's accumulated on a site like yours? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, uh, and, and to be clear, I think archiving for the long term is is super important to us. And so we've, um, we, that, that's, that's one I think it's actually something that most most internet services today are not really set up with any concern for the future. They're just they're, it's about like you know what's happening right now, and then the content that's even a week later is not really relevant. Um, so so we have a big focus on this. We um, you know I, I could imagine you know one thing I've I always wondered about when I was when I've looked at history, um, you know you get. This interpretation of history that's very colored by the person who's writing yeah. the, the history, and you um, you don't really have a sense for how people were feeling, or maybe you know how some people were feeling, but you don't know how most of the people were feeling, or what the different perspective of views were. Um, and so I think it's uh, it's really amazing that in a hundred years from now, people will be able to look back and through Cora and and other services. They'll be able to get a sense for really, like, what did people think of Donald Trump? Like, what, what was the true reaction to to this this candidate? Answer: diverse, <laughs> yeah. shockingly diverse, very, very diverse, surprisingly diverse, perhaps. But we're not going to get into into <laughs> politics here. But it's a it's a to me, it's the harder question is, you know, something like inequality, which the media talks about all the time. Uh, a lot of times, historians get at what, well, what do people really think about an issue? They look at a diary, mm -hmm. one person's diary. And what we're creating with the internet, for better or for worse, is a hundred, hundreds of millions of diaries in a certain sense, right? Yep. Uh, millions of blogs, 
billions, trillions of comments, trillions of photographs. Uh, so, you know, what people care about in certain spaces, now inequality is a lot tougher, right? So to take photographs of it, literally. Um, but these are the questions that conceivably we'd have a better understanding of because of the information we have, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, let's close with you. Um, you've been here six years. You built something extraordinary. Um, what's the future of, of you? Do you think you'll be here for a long, long time? Is, you know, are you going to go public? Are you going to get sold? Do you have other dreams, other projects that you hope to get to? Maybe they'll be part of Quora, maybe not. Anything you want to share? Yeah, I mean, uh, so our, our intent is to go public at some point. Uh, we're not in a rush to do it, but we want to be a long-term independent company. Um, I'm personally committed to just sticking with it as, as long as, as it takes. Um, I, I, I couldn't see any reason why I would do anything else. Because you're not bored. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not bored. And I think it just things get much more exciting as, as we get bigger and bigger. We have more scale. We have more data. We have, we're reaching more people. We're getting more knowledge shared into the world. So... Um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm totally committed. Uh, we're sitting here in Silicon Valley in Mountain View, um, California. What's happening outside this building that you think is underappreciated or underreported about the future? You know, right now, if you ask me, as a total amateur who doesn't swim in the circles that you swim in, I would say things like, well, you know, we drive driverless cars, digital health. There's some obvious trends. Um, What's going under the radar, if anything, that you think is important? Um, or under my radar, at least. Yeah, let's see. I mean, I think, I think one thing that's under a lot of people's radar, including people in the industry, is just the power of personalization. It's, um, th there's this effect where y you, as a user of any of these products, you're only seeing one experience. And you don't, it's not very intuitive to you that every other user is seeing things that are totally different. And... Uh, and there's a lot of hype around machine learning and AI, which I think some of which is justified and some is probably not. But ultimately, I think one of the biggest impacts that the that machine learning has on on the economy is through enabling better and better personalization, um, which allows these products to get much much better for for any given user than than they used to be. Um, so I think all these all these companies all these personalization companies I expect to get much bigger than. Than they already are, and I think you're, you're going to see personalization in all these, all these other markets where it never existed before. Do you want to say anything about the, either in Quora or outside Quora, about the, some trade-off that might exist with personalization? So, you know, I think when I think of, um, you know, when I think of Quora, I think, well, that's good. It'd be great to have answers and questions that are, are more interesting to me. But when I think of, say, Amazon. Is it really that exciting that they're going to get better at selling me stuff for, you know, that the, that the, because yeah, maybe it'll just be stuff that has a better margin for them. And I, I sometimes uh, worry that this personalization is not always going to be, as we say in economics, welfare improving. It'll be improving for the company. Um, and then these companies are getting very large. Is it, is, are they going to be able to restrain themselves from exploiting this in ways that, that might be harmful to their to the political process than cracking down on it. Yeah, I think um, yeah, you can actually. I, I think one interesting thing recently was Facebook came out and disclosed how they think about personalizing their news feed. And I think the one of the reasons that is just a guess from outside. I'm not speaking on on their behalf, but I I would guess that part of the motivation there is to get ahead of regulators because they, they'd rather have. The, the public understand what they're trying to do then have these misconceptions out there that then lead to regulation, sure. which could be much worse, I think, for sure. them and probably also for the public. Um, of course, we have no idea if they were telling the truth. Right, but, but at least, you know, they, they probably have some incentive to tell the truth because there might be, you know, if a Leaks. regulator comes sure. along, along later. So at least even the, the threat of regulation, I think, is good for, for protecting consumers. Um, I think, you know, in, in these... Companies that are selling a product that are not ad supported, I think per, uh, personalization enables price discrimination. Sure. And uh, I think Amazon has actually taken a very strong stance against price discrimination, but you know that could reverse at some point. There could be other companies that that uh, that don't care to yeah. to value the user. Yeah, or just 
I, you know, I think, I don't know. I, you know, I'm a big believer in competition, and, and I don't think, um, in general, showing me stuff I want to buy I don't think is evil. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's generally a good thing. I'd rather look at stuff I want to buy than stuff I don't want to buy. But uh, I think the issue of sort of margin and um, uh, competition in this space is, is relevant. It's going to, I think, be an issue as we move in this direction. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I could see companies, companies pushing things that are, that are higher margin for them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to think about what's the right, from an economics perspective, what's the right solution to, to prevent that from happening. Yeah, I'm it's, with you there. It's, 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 uh, <laughs> it's not obvious. Yeah, it's not clear. Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think that's, that's everything that's been, been great. My guest today has been Adam D'Angelo. Adam, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for EconTalk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.